the ANC has got a program of action of trying to destabilize all parties it views as threats. Um, it happened through COPE, it happened to the EFF, and it also happened to us that the ANC will always want to destabilize such parties. Now, with us as an organization, Welcome to another episode of Sunny World Engage, a platform where we engage people of interest in the South African public life. And today our guest is Mr. Violetu Zugola, the leader of the African Transformation Movement, the ATM. Mr. Zugola, I thank you very much sir, for availing yourself and uh, honoring our invite. Kubule um, Lamna, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. Last time we had a conversation, my leader, we, it was around the week when Mr. Mzadadman, who was your head of police at the time, had announced that uh, he was leaving for, for, for the EFF. And at the time, there was a lot of speculation about why he was leaving. But suddenly it became evident when he was made the MP of the EFF. Were you surprised? Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like I stated when we last spoke, but when he left, he gave us his reasons and we wished him well. So we're not invested as to what then happens to um, his life after leaving the organization because it's his choice as to what he decides to do with his political life. Mm. In terms of the ATM itself, are you happy with what you guys have done specifically yourself as the representative in the national assembly since the last election and uh, what what have you achieved since 2019 up to now in parliament yeah look even though a lot of people might want to know us as a party that brought about accountability on the parliament parliament but the you know let me start with 2019 where we're aggressively pushing the prioritization of south africans in the economy the issue of the township economy never found any discussion in the um, in parliament. But now, if you talk about the informal economy, township economy, the enforcement of labor laws and immigration laws, the question of ensuring Gububa, um, you know, um, South Africans are basically prioritized in almost all sectors in our country. That is something that we brought about as part of our, our, our work in parliament. So we're very proud in the sense that we've managed to deal with the bread and butter issues that affect the people and deal with the issues concerning the abuse of power by very powerful individuals such as the president. Mm. The formation of the ATM, it's anchored on the church, as it were. You know, historically it has proved that uh, South Africa, as much as South Africa is mostly a, a Christian country, but people don't you know, don't participate in politics based on their religious beliefs. Uh, you, do you think it was wise to anchor the, uh, the ATM, uh, you know, along Christianity? Look, the ATM is not anchored on Christianity. The ATM was founded by um, predominantly religious organizations, including AMACOS, including community organizations who wanted change. That is why ever since we got to parliament, there's never a time whereby you can hear any member of the ATM saying the Bible says this, therefore this must happen. It is always members of the organization saying this is what should happen, you know, taking into account the lived realities of the people. However, the, the church element or the faith element is very important because it speaks to the values we ought to live by. For example, we all know that we don't have Ubuntu as a country. Because had we had to want to never have these um, leaders being given the powers to actually provide their services or provide leadership on behalf of the people. However, Bona, they only think about their own self-interest. That shows the death of a, a very important value system, which is Ubuntu. So when we're saying as the ATM, let's get back or let's have values of which we could be proud to say this is a character of South Africans. That is where it becomes important to say, let us be founded on something that brings us together, something what it means to be a human being, because so that is the, how um, ATEM is anchored. It is anchored on the value system. It's anchored on spirituality of all of us, of which all of us, we agree um, as, as a society that we need a values-driven society. Why did you join the ATM? In fact, maybe the question is this way. Were you there from the onset of the formation of the party? And why did you feel that this is the correct political vehicle to bring about change in the country? 
Yeah, look, um, I was there from the beginning. Initially, I was never a member of any political party because what I disliked was how people take podiums and speak as if they are for the people. However, behind the scenes, they make dealings and they make, um, you know, they, they do things that are not for the interests of the people. So I did not like how people also fight for power, where, whereas we should be encouraging cooperation, collaboration, and not fight over who gets to be what. So when ATM um, was discussed amongst these organizations, the religious organizations, then I was there um, um, and I was given the responsibility to initiate the registration of the party and go to the different churches to explain the importance of having a values-driven political party. Um, and I, I fell in love with how the organization is not self-centered. That is why we are able to attend and support um, organizations and other political organizations. And that is why even when it comes to governance, when the ruling party is correct, we are able to say, you are correct here. But when you are wrong as a ruling party, we are able to call you out. So we are not a self-centered organization whereby it's all about ATM. We believe that we need to put South Africans first by having um, you know, a, a politics that is about the people instead of politics that is about a certain political party. Mm. And as an individual, as you say, you were never in politics. How did, how, how did that affect you, you know, joining a, a politics, mainstream politics for the first time and assuming such a huge responsibility as the leader of that party and you made it to parliament, finding yourself in this, you know, highly charged political environment? Did that affect you at all in terms of, you know, how you felt? Did you ever feel overwhelmed or was it just a walk in the park? Look, um, I believe Uba, God will never give you, um, you know, a responsibility, but not give you or not grace you um, with the ability to fulfill that responsibility. In my view, um, the responsibility I have now does not come from me. It's not because of my intellect. It's not because of my wisdom. It is because God decided I need to play this role now. So it's not about myself. So that allows me to interact um, with um, people, whether they are high-level, pro high-profile people in our country, or whether it is Abandu Baseklaneni, even members of other opposition parties, or even their ruling party, I'm able to engage with them and um, take lessons from them. Because in my understanding, leadership is all about being able to influence Abandu towards a particular direction. And where the country is now, it needs a new type of leadership, leadership that is able to say, um, even though I may, be, I may be the president of ATM, but Labrao Upai Lokshin, who's addressing or who's informing me about Ingrid Thiel, he's correct, therefore, I need to learn from him. And at the same time, if a member of another opposition party is raising something, I must not, um, you know, dimpiki said because I want to shine as a leader, but I need to understand to go back. The state we are in as a country requires leadership um, that sees the bigger picture. And in seeing the bigger picture, we need to work together. So I've never felt overwhelmed. I've never um, felt to go back. I'm out of place because I'm able to remain calm. I'm able to remain focused on what I'm expected to do as a leader of ATM. Mm. The, the formation of the party itself had a lot of drama or controversy around it, especially as it relates to the ANC and the attention it, it gave to the formation of the EFF with all sorts of speculation about certain then leaders of the ANC to be specific, uh, their former SG, Mr. Ace Mahashule and uh, former President Zuma, uh, allegedly being the hand that was behind the formation of the, of, 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 of the ATM. Of course, they did their internal investigation, which uh, absorbed those individuals that were suspected to have a hand. Did you guys, as the ATM, get ordered at the time by the attention the ANC was giving you guys and probably even do your own internal investigation? Look, what is um, known, and it is something that about all people know, the ANC has got a program of action of trying to destabilize all parties it views as threats. Um, it happened through COPE, it happened to the EFF, and it also happened to us that the ANC will always want to destabilize such parties. Now, with us as an organization um, that is led by someone that was never in politics, you could not use corruption 
as a means of tainting me um, and inadvertently uh, taint the image of the organization. That is why they had that um, program of action to say ATM was, was formed by uh, Mr. Zuma or Mr. Mahashule, of which later on, as you say, there was a report that was done by, I think it was Kalema Matland and Dr. Frim Jijuala. Yeah. And out of that report, they absolved all of these individuals to say none of them were involved in the formation, operation, or anything to do with the uh, ATM. But you'll never see that um, report actually making it public knowledge because it benefits the ANC when Abando are always going to be suspicious of different political parties because then people are going to say, let's stick with the devil that we know. But when they see that the, the, the lies that were peddled like, against the ATM were actually a creation of them as the ANC because there's an advocate from the Western Cape who wrote an affidavit saying that he was tasked by senior members of the ANC, which includes Mr. Ramaphosa, Gwete Mantashe, and Fikile Mbalula, to work on a plan to destabilize the ATM. And he was tasked um, to look at um, the documents in the IEC. Um, and, you know, there was a war room. The people that were bought from um, the churches um, were actually funded by the ANC. So that is why um, we are saying as the ATM that it is the work of the ANC to try and destroy opposition parties. Mm -hmm. And have you been able to shake off that uh, uh, stink, as it were, that you are associated with certain ANC uh, leaders? Because as you say, much as they were cleared, but that still lingers in the air as to whether there were any ANC people, uh, you know, in the formation or operations on the ATM. Look, the fact that we're talking about it now means we have not completely shaken it off. Yeah. Um, Precisely because when these allegations were made, uh, many media houses went on to report it, you know, and I remember it was the Sunday before the election. I think it was Sunday Times. They had billboards all over the country. First time I saw Sunday Times, whether you are in Yandi or you are at Delft in the Western Cape, there were billboards that were saying Ace's hand in the ATM. Now, this report comes up, but you don't see the appetite from the media as well to try and educate or inform people to say, we, um, we reported on these allegations. However, here's the clarity now um, that these allegations were actually false. Therefore, it is our duty as a media. So it, if we had as a country media that is objective, media that is not part of this political um, you know, system that we have, um, would have such reporting. But because again, the media um, there's some people who own the media also fund these political parties. So they're involved in terms of setting the political agenda. So that is why we're not surprised that some of the media houses which read the allegation now did not run with the, um, with the clearance of these allegations because it suits the narrative the funders of these media houses and the political parties want to have of having the opposition parties, including the ATM, not being taken seriously or being suspected by members of society. Well, and as you say, it was just on the eve of the previous elections, which were your first 2019 that you contested at national and provincial level. Do you believe that those allegations did, uh, you know, affect the performance of the ATM in those particular elections? Definitely, definitely. I remember there was also a case whereby there was, um, it was widely reported in the media to say ATM will not be on the ballot paper. So we had to convince people again because people were like, oh, you're not going to be in the ballot paper, therefore we're not going to vote for you. So we needed to work harder to convince some of the people. And remember, our electorate in our country is a band that believes um, so much in the media. If something is, um, is on the news, either TV or print media, they're most likely to believe it including if you are going to be having a well-funded campaign by Sunday Times that is saying Ace's hand in the ATM, the very same Ace that was accused of um, you know, corruption in the free state, therefore it did play a part in terms of influence people not to vote for us as an organization. Therefore, that propaganda by the ANC, because the root, um, um, the, 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 the founding, the people that drove that propaganda, it comes from the ANC. So that action by the ANC was basically to make sure that ATM does not get the, the level of electoral support it would have gotten if they did not um, you know, pl play politics with us. Oh, oh. 
you earlier said that uh, you know your one of your main uh, campaigns, especially in recent times, say since last year, has been uh, your your passion in you know calling for accountability uh, relating to the Parabola saga of of the theft of the dollars at uh, President Ramaphosa's farm. Are you happy with how far that matter has gone? Do you believe that the president has been held fully accountable for that saga? Not at all. The opposite of holding some, someone accountable has happened because let's start with the parliament processes. Parliament elects a president and is constitutionally obligated to hold the president accountable. Now, section 42 3 of the constitution states that the National Assembly must scrutinize the actions of the executive. Now, when parliament received a report from an independent panel, and an independent panel, they mandated to look into the matter to say um, whether there was any prima facie evidence of wrongdoing. Now, when that independent com panel comes back and says there is evidence of wrongdoing, therefore, the logical thing, it is to investigate or scrutinize. When parliament takes a decision to say we are not going to scrutinize because there are other agencies and they cited um, the Office of the Public Protector and the Hawks, um, Reserve Bank and SARS, that clearly meant to Koba Parliament has abrogated its responsibility of holding the executive accountable because you can't have a parliament that is obligated by the constitution to scrutinize actions of the president. But parliament says, no, 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 we're not going to do that because other institutions are doing so. If you look at um, um, the report by the acting public protector, also it was a biased report because it was basically a job application because had to advocate Zaleka came out and um, you know with a report that found that there may have been wrongdoing on the side of Mr. Ramaphosa. Chances are yesterday they would never be elected as a as a as a public protector because Mr. Ramaphosa heads the very same organization that has majority either to install her as a public protector or not install as a as a public protector. Come to SARS um, to to the Reserve Bank. When they are saying Kuba, um, you know, Mr. Ramaphosa was not in violation of um, Exchange Controls Act because the, the sale was not concluded. Whereas in his own words, Mr. Ramaphosa confirms but the sale was concluded. So it clearly shows here that all institutions now in our country in relation to this um, saga have been operating in a manner that um, should be troublesome or should be worrisome to citizens in the sense that they refuse to do their work all to protect an individual, which is Mr. Ramaphosa. And our argument is that the country, the constitution is bigger than an individual. We can't bend the rules to suit an individual. Just recently, yesterday, there's someone who got arrested for having undeclared millions of US dollars, but nothing happened to Mr. Ramaphosa. If you look at, for example, his obligation in terms of reporting the 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 the, 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 the theft in his farm, he's he's obligated because in that close cooperation, he's the main. In fact, he's the sole member of that clo um, close cooperation. And um, Section 34 of PRECA clearly states that if you are a responsible person, meaning a member of a close cooperation, you are obligated to report any theft. Um, above 100,000, which Mr. Ramaphosa did not do. So, in our view, um, Mr. Ramaphosa, um, instead of being held accountable, the opposite has happened. Oh. And do you think there's anything that can be done further <clears throat> to achieve the kind of accountability that you as the ATM are, are wishing for, or is it game over as things stand? It's definitely not game over. We've gone to court. Um, you know, we want to challenge the public protector's report. Also, we've gone to court to challenge the, the resolution by um, parliament, uh, by the National Assembly, because we believe that resolution was basically in violation of section 43 of the constitution. Um, we've, um, um, we are going to submit papers to support parties that have taken the Reserve Bank report on review. So basically, um, this is not um, concluded by any means and once again come next year the ANC will not be majority and we know that some of these shenanigans that we see now it is because people the people that are heading these institutions are trying to find political favor of the ANC 
But when the ANC is under 50%, I can guarantee you, you are going to see a change of mind from these institutions because their lives and their, their work will not be um, determined or um, reliant on the ANC being in power. Mm. But if you don't have uh, confidence in the current now public protector, you don't have confidence in the South African Reserve Bank, in, in how they handle the matter, you don't have confidence in parliament, do you have confidence that the courts will do anything different from the other institutions? Look, the law is very clear. And the law, what I like about the law is that we can all read, we can all know, for example, that if Section 34 of Preka says that a responsible person or a person in a, in a position of authority, which is a person that in the context of Mr. Ramaphosa is a, um, is a, is a, is a, is a sole member of a close corporation, once there is theft that he's aware of, of more than 100,000 rands, he's obligated to report that matter, not to anyone, not to just to any policeman, but to the DPCI. Therefore, if the courts were to come with a ruling that is otherwise, then the courts would basically be encouraging people to undermine them. And then you are going to have a failed state because there is no way in which now the courts themselves are going to bend the rules to support or in favor of Mr. Ramaphosa and then believe Ukoba, the citizens will willy-nilly abide by the rulings of the courts. It can't be. You can't have justice whereby the, the, the laws, when it comes to you, um, you know, they, they are bended. But when it comes to me, the, the very same laws are kept, um, you know, the same. So <clears throat> it is the courts that will need to make that determination, Ukoba, they want to be respected or they want the public to stop trusting them. Well, as the ATM, it didn't support the impeachment <clears throat> of uh, um, the uh, now former public protector, Advocate Gusisi Mkweban. Why? Um, Advocate Mkweban, if you look at the work that she's done on a case basis, you find that um, she's completed more cases, dealt with more bread and butter issues, made the office of the public protector to be more accessible Remember that office is designed specifically for people that would not have ordinary access to courts, meaning they do not have um, the finances to actually go to courts. So <clears throat> advocating Kweban actually taking the, um, taking the office of the public protector to majority of the citizens um, was one of the things that we admired the most. Now, if you look at the cases that are there that she's lost when it comes to and being reviewed. Number one, she's not the first public protector to lose cases. And secondly, that institution is a quasi-judicial board in the sense that it operates almost in, in, in the same way as magistrates or judges. In the same way, you are going to have a magistrate handing down a judgment, and later on that judgment gets to be overturned, <clears throat> either by a high court or Supreme Court of Appeal, it is the same thing with Advocate Mkweban or the Office of a Public Protector. There's also a judge, I think it's Judge Pottery. She has more than 21 um, of her judge, judgments being overturned, but no one is speaking about the, no one is speaking about her incompetence because it is the nature of a judiciary. That is why you have a constitutional court that will adjudicate, um, which is the last um, defense when it comes to adjudicating on matters. So that is the one part. The second part or the other part relates to what um, one would term the, the discussion where on how on the HR matters. Now, if a similar inquiry would be held now relating to either Professor um, Advocate Bagdonsela or Advocate Zaleka, you find that chances are there will be people in any organization that will not be happy with your leadership style. So that could not be a, a, a basis of determining whether a person is competent or not competent. So those are the reasons why we felt as the ATM Mukoba we can't support that impeachment. Well, do you, do you <clears throat> believe though that uh, Anuk Nkwewan was playing politics because the other ambition <clears throat> was that she is biased and is involved in ALC factional shenanigans and just shenanigans at the level of <clears throat> you know, parties themselves, competing themselves, uh, among themselves, people saying she was closer to the EFF, among other things, she was closer to certain uh, ANC politicians. What is your take on that? 
Um, the office receives complaints. It's the constitution that forces her to investigate complaints. And she does not investigate alone as an individual. There's a team of investigators there. There's a team of other legal experts in that office that actually help in terms of drafting the reports, doing the investigation and so forth. Therefore, we did not see anything that would suggest that Advocate Mkwemani was playing politics because she did not actively run after people. It is cases, it is, look at, for example, the CR17 matter. It is my man who went to the public protector to complain. Similarly, on the Padapala matter, it is us that went to the public protector to say, investigate. Therefore, you know, it is a, a lousy allegation to say she was playing politics, whereas she was doing what the constitution requires her to do, which is to investigate. After investigating, issue a report. Well, why are you opposed to, to the appointment of her replacement mm -hmm. advocate? Um, advocate Galeka, on the question of Palapan, um, look from a from a principal point of view, you have who advocate Mkweban that is suspended immediately after um, um, submitting those 31 questions. Now, this I, I, um, deputy public protector now has got um, a difficulty in the sense that the person who can appoint her, because the person who can appoint her is the president of the ANC. Now, she is uh, given a responsibility to investigate her. Uh, investigate this person. Now, when she does an investigation, she does an investigation that is completely different or completely opposed to the wisdom of a former chief justice, um, a retired judge, and a senior advocate. Because the matters that she was investigating are the very same matters these um, 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 senior advocates and a former chief justice actually investigated and found there is, um, there is a prima facie case of wrongdoing. So on the handling of Palapala, and if you were to check how she went now to the media defending Palapala, and to an extent whereby she was not even making sense from a legal point of view, clearly shows that she was using that report as a means of securing favor from the incumbent, which is Mr. Ramaphosa, the head of the ANC, the ANC that has got majority in parliament, that has got the majority to either appoint as a public protector or not appoint as a public protector. So it is in that view that we felt, Boba, this person, um, if they are going to bend um, the law, they are going to play politics with the law simply because they want to ascend to, poli uh, to, ascend to um, the office of a public protector, cannot be trusted because, again, that office, you need someone that is going to be able to find against the president. It happened with advocate Madonzel, and she was lambasted, she was called names and so forth, but the law was the law. It happened with advocate Mkwebane, the same thing happened, even the worst thing happened to an extent whereby she got to be impeached in the process. So you need a public protector that will not be afraid to hold the president accountable. But when you've got a public protector that will now seemingly want to operate in a manner that um, um, is benefiting the ones that are in power, then the public is no longer being protected from abuse of power. Oh. So you do believe that the office of a public protector can be used for nefarious political reasons. If that logic follows then, uh, if it can be used with Advocate Karega, surely it would have been used with the other predecessors, not only limited to what we can do and Advocate Madonsera as well. Well, um, the, your question was relating to Advocate Mkweban, and my answer was based on the work that she's done, based on the nature of the complaints she received, and based on the work that she's been doing in terms of the, the seven years she's been in office, we would not have seen anything that would suggest Okoba she, um, she was used by political players. Not to say that, because there is no office that is, would be immune from uh, you know, wanting to play politics, even judges for that matter. However, ours as politicians or ours as a party is to look at the conduct. We can't just take a blanket approach to say because it was used to, um, with Advocate Madonzela, it is used with Advocate Nkobad. We need to examine the evidence and also shy away from a case whereby because it was used in the past, therefore we need to judge 
the incumbent, which is advocate Mkwebane, because of the actions of um, um, advocate Matt oh. the, the 2024 national and provincial elections are around the corner. <clears throat> what is the strategy of the ATM and what are the permutations in terms of what you are likely uh, uh, to garner as your electoral support? And have you done internal research within ATM that shows that this is how you are allowed to perform in next year's elections? Um, you know, the organization, we've been hosting rallies um, ever since the beginning of September all across the, the, the nine provinces. We're in Jobek, we're um, for two consecutive weekends, we're in Pumalanga, um, this week, Sisem Tata, this weekend, Sisem Tata, um, also next weekend, Sisem Pizana and KZN. So we are going out to the people who are going um, to campaign and just make them aware of our message. And our message is very clear to say South Africans must reclaim their power. For far too long, South Africans think Uba, power belongs to politicians, whereas power belongs to them. Um, and they, many South Africans believe politicians are these celebrities that um, um, ought to be worshipped, whereas politicians are their servants whereby citizens must dictate to politicians as to what must happen. Now, from a policy point of view, we've got key priorities. For example, the first one is human settlements to say the inner city must be transformed to redress some of the, 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 the evil of apartheid because what apartheid did, it took people far away from places of economic activity, which is to the townships, <coughs> and to the outskirts. Now, if people are staying in, um, in the inner city, they are close to places of economic activity. And we are saying again that on the crime issue, the country needs to deal decisively with criminals. South Africa cannot be, you know, playing sweetheart with criminals. Criminals must know that they've got no place in our society. Meaning if a person um, is, um, is, is, is an inmate, they can't go there by Chilex, eh? whereas we've got dirty towns that they should be cleaning, um, you know, um, or any other work that sh they should be doing as part of paying back society that they've wronged. Because currently, if your daughter, for example, were to be raped and the person that rapes your daughter gets to be imprisoned, your taxes as a father pays for that um, person to have three meals a day. It pays for him to have access to water. It pays for him to have access to electricity. It also pays for him to have a free education, whereas you, as a victim, you know, you do not have access to free education. So that is why, as an ATM, we are saying, Oba, prisoners must work for the state as a part of, um, you know, earning back um, their place in society. Again, we're also saying when it comes to the economy, Oba, our minerals must be processed here. And we need to have an education system that will make people understand about the diamonds, the gold, all minerals that we have. Because currently, when you speak about all of the minerals we have in our country, to a lot of people, it's like, it's abstract. They've never seen gold, they've never seen diamond, whereas it is a resource that is there in their own country. We're also saying the economy must be transformed <clears throat> to make sure Oba predominantly black South Africans are active participants in the economy because now South Africans are basically spectators. Go to the townships. Townships, it is foreigners that are owning all economic activities from spazas, hardware shops, barber shops, all manners of economic activity. And yet Tina is the ATM are saying it is South Africans that must dominate all sectors, whether it is the informal economy or the, the commanding hearts of the economy. And on the education system, we're also saying it must be skills-based in the sense that by the time a person leaves the schooling system, which is metric, they must be able to have a skill they can utilize to make a living for themselves instead of being dependent on someone else for jobs. There are critical skills like your critical thinking, your problem solving, which should be inculcated in our education system. And there's also technical skills. And our education system must speak to the needs of the economy. It must respond to what does the economy need. So when we've been speaking about that message, we saw that it resonates with a lot of people. That is why we are very confident as the ATM Oba. Come next year, Abandu will see 
flames when it comes to our election and uh, to the election results. Oh, I'm listening to your policy, you know, uh, the uh, uh, talk. <laughs> And I'm hearing EFF, I'm hearing PEC, I'm hearing Azapo, I'm hearing uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, parties with pan-African <clears throat> uh, leanings. What is the plan as it relates to you guys, the parties that have that uh, come from that school of thought, in terms of collaboration and working together towards the elections and probably even having one face for the position of president and post the elections in the event of uh, a coalition government. And I say this against the backdrop that the liberal parties on the other side, uh, so-called moon, moonshot pact or whatever <coughs> you call it now, uh, they are moving uh, in unison, going to the elections. They seem to have a plan, but you guys on the other side are all over the place. No, we're not all over the place. We have been talking. Yeah. Um, we have been talking. You will recall that in the past year or so, when ATM has got um, its programs, we're celebrating five years in Kabeha in May. Um, EUTM was there, EFF was there. And again, when EFF had their um, same um, celebrating 10 years were there, in the policy conference of the PAC, we were there, Azapo was there. So there are discussions. However, we want, as these organizations, our discussions to be based on principle and not jump the gun. Um, and not be fixated about one phase for the elections or any of these things that would um, lead to these organizations not to work to be able to work together. In the sense that, for example, um, we are of the view, over at the basic level, this party should protect our votes in the sense that if there's a voting station whereby these other parties are not there, but there is an ATM party agent. That party agent must know over they need to protect the votes of all of these parties. So that is why I'm coming from a spirit of working together, not a spirit that is all about um, power. Because, you know, in the back in the day, you find that what was important was a program of action to say, this is where we are as a country. This is the program of action that we need in order to address all of these problems. And then the question of leadership comes last. Whereas now the culture now is all about who gets to be president, of which in our view, it is an approach that will never be sustainable. Let's agree on what needs to be done and let's agree um, you know, on the programs. And then after the question of leadership is informed by, this is a program that we need to do. And this is the character um, in terms of the leadership that can best lead us in terms of achieving this program. So that is our approach as this party. Well, what do you think of the Munichot Pact? Well, they call it <laughs> multi-party coalition charter now. That's the new name. Look, it has got nothing to do with the interests of South Africans. There is one um, person who was offered money to be there and he declined. And he went out, I think two people um, of other organizations who went out and said they were offered a lot of money to be there uh, but they, they declined, which clearly shows Uba. It's nothing, it's got nothing to do about policies, nothing to do about the interests of South Africans, because immediately you put money first and say, come join this thing. Um, here in return, you are going to have this money. It clearly shows that you are not about the people, because if you are about the people, you are going to lobby people based on your policy propositions, based on your plan or vision for the country not putting money as an incentive. So the fact that money is the top of the agenda in terms of the Moonshot Pack clearly shows that the Moonshot Pack is all about retaining the status quo because you know that the Moonshot Pack is led by the DA, the DA that believes in privatization, the DA that believes um, in a liberal economy, um, that does not believe, for example, that black people should own land, that does not believe Okoba, the SMMEs must be prioritized um, and, you know, you have got multiple players in the economy. That does not believe that we need to redress the, 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 the wrongs of the past, which is apartheid by BEE, amongst other policies. So that is the, DA, that is the moonshot pack, basically. And these other parties, Chen, but um, maybe, because, again, politics is expensive. So you've got people that would rather sell out um, Abandabamnyama, sell out 
um, um, the, the vulnerable black people all because they want to have money to campaign so that they get to be in parliament when they are in parliament they do not raise anything that will be of benefit to black people that is why also this question Imani Vela to say we've got majority of black people in parliament um, in terms of the 400 members of parliament but we're not seeing changes it is precisely because it's just black faces because those people yes they are there but behind them it is these people such as the DA and their funders who are dictating the agenda to these people and these people Shem, they are just mouthpiece of this establishment that wants to continue and uh, that wants South Africa to continue in, in, in this part. Were you, were you approached as the ATM to join the moonshot? They would never. <laughs> they would yeah. never. They know exactly where we stand. Yeah. Ever since we got to parliament, we've made it very clear. Even when there was a discussion amongst opposition parties, we as the ATM were saying that we would not want to be part of any arrangement that is seemingly anti-ANC. Because you don't fix a country by being anti the ruling party. You fix a country by being pro the people. By being pro the people means when the ruling party is correct, it is correct. You can't propose for the sake of opposing. Secondly, you need to put policy proposals to say, here's a problem of crime. This is how we're going to address it. Here's a problem of unemployment. This is how we're going to address it. Not to have a policy that is saying ANC out, but you're not giving hope to the people or you're not practically showing the people this is how you are going to deal with their lived realities. Mm. And, and you speak about the funding, Carol, that was dangled for the other parties to join the Moonshot Pact. Who funds the ATM? How do you guys survive financially? Um, the ATM is funded by its members. Um, we Even in, the, uh, in May, when we are hosting our, our uh, celebration, we asked for pledges and people pledged. And people um, pay membership, form, uh, membership fees and also there's that allocation coming from the IEC. So we're able to survive. That is why, um, unfortunately, we do not have a big budget that would allow us to buy um, airtime in terms of the media, print millions of T-shirts, because we are of the view, but we have to make a choice. It's either we allow ourselves to be captured and then we become a mouthpiece of the very same people that have caused all of these hardships for the citizens or we remain independent so that we can be able to independently speak truth to power and also raise these uncomfortable truths um, and, and discussions at every chance we get. That is why in all the years I've been in parliament, I've never said something in parliament and after I get a phone call, ATM phone did, um, don't say this because we pay your bills. Yeah, well, that is why you are able to talk about drugs freely to say drugs are killing our, our future because we're not funded by drug dealers. That is why we're able to say um, the banking sector must be transformed. There must be a state bank because we're not funded by banks. That is why we're even saying, Okoba, the, the, the telecommunications industry, the data prices are too high and there must be transformation because almost all of these industries, it is oligopolies whereby it's five or six companies that are dominating the entire industry. We're saying there must be transformation. So we're able to freely speak about these things because there's no one behind us who says, if you say these things, we're going to withdraw funding or we're going to expose you, Koba. There's data money involved because I think the, 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 the challenge of many politicians is that they fall into the trap of accepting money and then they become people who can't independently voice out Isindo that Abantu want them to be voiced out. I remember one time we were debating on the question of the informal economy. We led that debate as the ATM and most of the parties were opposed to us. After the debate, and they were heckling me when I was debating, after the debate, two members came to me from the ANC and they're saying, hey, my leader, these are both proposals and continue. And I asked one guy, but why inside were you heckling me and why were you opposed to this? And the guy said, look, our party bosses gave us a line. And obviously those party bosses are informed or influenced by whoever gives them the money. So that is the problem that we have in the sense that even if something is a problem, but because our politicians are in the pockets of people 
they are unable to openly speak about the problems that are faced by a multitude of citizens. Currently, we've got a problem of, um, you know, our children, our people in our townships being fed poison. It's biological warfare, these fake, expired and rejected goods. But ask yourself a question, what has the governing party done? What has these media and NGOs, if, if it was South Africans that were selling um, and such goods, poisonous goods to foreigners, they would have easily labeled it as xenophobia. They're saying nothing. Why? Because number one, they want to be politically correct. Number two, they do, they do not want to risk their funding because some of them, they are also funded by these very same um, establishment or organizations that benefit from this lawlessness we, lawlessness we see in our country. Well, I'm sure as ATM, we don't even take a cent from the churches led by the founding fathers of the party. Look, that's why I'm saying it is our members. So if you are a member of the church and you say you are going to donate, but there's never been an instance whereby a church as an organization mm -hmm. donates to us. It is always members, individual members of the ATM who also happen to be members of the churches. Also, members of the ATM are also not members of any organization, but members of any church organization. But because they believe um, in what we believe and they have seen the importance of having independent um, um, representatives in parliament who are not in the pockets of these people that are destroying our country. Why do you believe that uh, foreigners are a problem in this country? Look, we're not saying foreigners are a problem. We are saying, Bukoba, when a person wants to come to South Africa, they must come through legal means. Mm -hmm. That is the case all over the world. It's only in South Africa whereby um, people who illegally come to a country are entertained. That's the first thing. And also, South Africa, as a government or as a state, has got its obligation on South Africans. Go to the government of Cambodia. The, the government of Cambodia only talks about the citizens of Cambodia. Go to China, go to Japan, go to all countries in the world. So we're saying as the ATM, the same has happened here in the sense that the state must look out um, on the interests of South Africans first in the sense that when there are job opportunities, the state must be, the, the, the companies operating in South Africa, they must satisfy themselves, but there is no South African that can do this work Therefore, let us go look personally in the Sadek region, also in Africa. If they can't find someone in Africa, then they can go to Europe. But in a case whereby South Africans are overlooked in terms of job opportunities in favor of non-South Africans, it becomes problematic. For example, go to the hospitality industry. Everyone can see there's no South Africans working there. And that is at the backdrop of South Africa having the highest unemployment rate in the world. Go to the question of the economy, businesses. You know, the township economy, it was black South Africans that were operating there. You could never go to a township of Manis Paza, Skafan de Merve. It was Ispaza, Skazungula, Ispaza, um, of so and so, a black South African. Now, when Asians, Pakistanis, and uh, Bangladeshis come and they displace South Africans from the economy, meaning South Africans are poorer now. And what we're also saying, um, seeing now, you know, people used to say, well, South Africans can't do business. That is why their businesses are falling and foreigners, their businesses are thriving. But in the, in the, with what we're seeing now, the amount of fake products clearly shows Zukuba. The problem is that South Africans were buying products and reselling them at the markup based on what they were getting from wholesalers. Whereas these guys, are actually poisoning South Africans. For example, if you go to a wholesaler, you buy a two liter there at 20 rands per unit. Obviously, man, copy up a foot between, you're going to sell it at 21 rands. But if that guy manufactures a fake Coca-Cola um, at, at, at nothing, chances are he can even charge five rands. That is why he's, they are able to, to, to sustain themselves. Also, look at the question of illegal mining. The reports are there, but majority of the illegal miners, they're not even South African. When what is the effect there is that um, communities are being, uh, you know, communities are, are being terrorized. So what we're saying is the ATM, let's apply the law. 
in the sense that what is the law saying in terms of movement? What is the law saying in terms of business, um, people operating their businesses? Law is very clear to say um, someone coming from outside of the country must invest a minimum of 5 million, employ 80% South Africans, um, um, make sure Ukuba they are registered with the CIPC, have a, a bank account, etc. Similarly, when it comes to employment, you need to offer a job to a non-South African on the condition that there's no South African that can do that work. And that South African, non-South African must actually um, train um, this South African to be able to take over, which is a skills transfer. You know, there's a friend of mine who got a job in Tanzania. And when he got a job in Tanzania, he was given five years to say, yes, you are bringing this skill, but um, train a local to have this skill and your contract is only five years. So what we're saying is the ATM, what is happening all over the world must happen a lot. And we cannot be afraid to speak about these truths simply because we want to have political correctness because the, 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 the death of South Africa um, happens when people want to be politically correct, but they do not address the, 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 the truth and they do not address the pressing matters that are negatively affecting South Africans. Oh. The proponents of the so-called xenophobia would argue and say, but you, you seem to be targeting the low end of fruit as in uh, foreigners from poor, poor countries like uh, Asia, Pakistanis, as you mentioned, African foreigners, but you are not as energetic and passionate as it relates to the European criminal syndicates that have taken over, for instance, Bedford View in the east of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, uh, Spain. What, how would you respond to that? Look, um, you know, on the question of minerals, we're saying that minerals must be processed here. Um, who owns many of these mines? It is people coming from Britain, etc. On the question of um, these guys um, that are, uh, uh, um, I could say, the syndicates when it comes to illegal mining, we have long argued to go back. If you want to deal with the question of illegal mining, Yes, you can remove that one illegal miner, but if the syndicate, if the system is still there, you are not going to deal with the matter. So we are advocating as the ATM a holistic approach that is based on what the law says, in the sense that regardless whether you come from China, you come from Eastern Europe, you come from America, you must follow your processes, number one, to come here. Whether you want to work, um, regardless of where you come from, you must follow the law. Uh, so that is what we've been long saying, and we're not making any apology to say whether a person, that is why, for example, when this guy, I forgot his name, but he was appointed to lead, the, um, the, he was a CEO of the new SAA, he was a British national, we're the only organization to say, but we can't have a British national um, that will be CEO of e -E, the new SAA, whereas we've got so many black professionals that are doing the work. Similarly, when there were 40 engineers that were coming from Germany, supposedly, to fix ESCOM, again, we're the only country to say, but we've got engineers. Why are we not um, employing the, 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 um, uh, the professionals in our country? However, on the question of dealing with non-South Africans, you find that because Abandu, um, you know, they do not want to confront facts, that is why they easily say, but why are you targeting this one, targeting those ones and not those ones? Whereas if they were to objectively observe or listen to all of our articulations and the statements we've issued when it comes to all sectors of the economy, people say, but there's consistency here. Whether it is the low-hanging fruit, again, low-hanging fruit for us is also important because we can't live in a country by politician. A person is guaranteed three meals a day, earns 50,000 in parliament, will say to South Africans, no, working as a waiter is, a, is, is crumbs. We need to work for mines. We need to work uh, where um, own banks. Whereas the NA is guaranteed meals. That person that is working as a waiter, the job of being a waiter stands between him and also sleeping without um, having something to eat. That is why you find during this time of COVID, there were people that were sleeping outside post offices for me planting 50 rands. Now, if you are so, if you are logic as a leader, there is no way you would say um, to people they must not take that job because it is crumbs. Um, whereas 
that job that you call as, as crumbs is a difference or stands between them and actually going to bed hungry and where now you are guaranteed three meals a day. So our view as the ATM over, there is no way I can stand and Dite Bandwini, they must not take jobs. But if I was in the same position as them, you know, if I did not have any job, I was, I was unemployed. If I got a job that would pay me a thousand rands a month, I would take it. So there's no way in which I would undermine loan to, um, of people earning a thousand rands a month because I know Koba, that thousand is something that is going to help people to actually put um, bread on the table. It's not the ideal situation, but it's much better than going to bed hungry. Therefore, when people are now having something to eat, you then have a band that will have energy to say, how do we make this thousand to be five thousand? How do we make this five thousand to be ten thousand? How do we make this ten thousand to be twenty? How do we make now um, that the ownership of the township economy actually translates to owning even the products that we have, have? Not have a case where by all of the products that we have in our country, either they produce outside of the country or it is products that are produced by repair companies. So you can grow from that, but when you have nothing, so that is why, in our view, all sectors of the economy matter. There is no economy that will not matter in a context of having um, 30 million South Africans that are in poverty, more than 10 million South Africans that are unemployed, more than 20 million South Africans that are dependent on social grants. When you have such a country, even if it's 350 grand, it matters. So there's no way as a party we can say it does not matter because if it matters to a poor citizen, it matters to us. Well, you mentioned Mr. Yohan Rupert. Do you believe that he has way too much power and he has too much dominance in many industries than uh, we know should be the case? Yeah, you know, they, I read a document that says, well, as we're sitting here, Chances are by the time you woke up, you came to work, if you got here at eight, chances are the toothpaste, um, maybe um, airtime, or if you're using Uber, but these chances are that you've already made money. So that is what we view as wrong in our country because you can't have few individuals that are dominating the economy. The economy must be structured in such a way that it must have multiple players, not have an economy whereby there's few players. That is why I made mention, for example, of the, um, let me make an example of the financial services industry. You are going to have Metropolitan, Sunlam, Old Mutual. You can count maybe five or six. Whereas we should be having multiple um, um, companies in that industry. Similar thing when it comes to telecommunications, MTN, Vodacom, Celsi, and maybe Telcom. Now, you find that few players servicing 62 million South African citizens, whereas in our view, you need to have multiple um, players, which is producers um, or companies in the, in the industries, not to have all of these industries dominated by five or six, and only to find that you have one individuals or few families that have got widespread, uh, widespread presence in almost all of these um, um, all of these industries. So that is why there's too much influence. And that is why um, we had Okoba, I think in the former um, President Zuma, when he wanted to reshuffle one minister, apparently um, the SG of the ANC was informed by Rupert Okoba. Um, if he wants, um, you know, he can basically make the economy crumble. So you can't have a case whereby an individual has got so much power to even utter such things because in our view, the government, which is politic, but politicians ought to have more power than the private sector because they are the ones that are governing. And when you govern, you don't govern only people. You govern everything that is happening in your country, including the companies. Look what happened in Nigeria. Who MTN there has got SIM cards that are not registered, that are used to commit crimes. The Nigerian government was not apologetic in saying you are fined if you don't pay this fine, Pumaniku economy aid. Similar thing happened in, in Malawi, whereby Umalti Choice wanted to increase prices, and Umalti, um, the Malawian government said, look, you are not, we are not going to entertain that um, out, but come to South Africa. The data prices of NTN as a South African company here, they are more expensive 
than when MTN is operating in other countries, which does not make sense. And that is precisely because the private sector has got too much power simply because our economy is controlled by few individuals. And politicians, unfortunately, most of them, they cannot confront this. For example, look at the case of um, um, the many leaders in the ruling party. They cannot um, genuinely work towards a state bank because if you look at their ownership, most of them, they own um, shares in banks. Therefore, they can't advocate for a company owned by the state that will take care of the financial interests of the people because they know but that company, which is a state bank, is basically going to eat away their own profits because they have shares in this bank. So that is one of the problems we have in our country. Oh, let's say if next year, uh, during the general elections, the results are hung, as the ATM, which parties would you consider going into a coalition with if you happen to be part of the negotiation uh, table where you know, a, a coalition government must be formed, and which parties would you definitely uh, not work with? Look, we've not sat down to say these are the parties for and these are the parties we'll never work against because n currently we don't know the composition of um, the parties that will be in parliament next year. We always want to base our views on principle to say if our manifesto guides us because our manifesto is an expression of what we want to achieve as a country. So if we are aligned in terms of what we view as policies, then we can um, openly work together because we want to have a case again as a part whereby in the country, whenever discussions are held, they must always be centered around policies because it is policies that are there to address the problems of the people. Not have a case whereby people are battering for positions to say, We'll vote for you, but in return, we want a minister, a minister of this and this and that, because it clearly shows Goba, these people are just power mongering. They're just uh, negotiating for themselves and not about the people. So we're saying in a nutshell, po our policies and alignment in terms of our policies will determine the parties we can work with next year. So thank you very much for your time and the uh, air conversation, which was very enlightening and interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I want to invite you now, ne? on the 2nd of December, East London will be launching the Manifesto A2. So we hope you do come, you cover, so that we don't complain, Nukoba, we do not get a time from you. And now at least, it's at least a month and a half before the event. So um, you can work around your budget, getting your approvals. But on the 2nd of December will be East London, Absa Stadium. Not only will the stadium will be filled, but the entire city will be full of ATM members. We will certainly be a watch that space. <laughs> That's how much you, I can prove it. You answer as a politician. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks so much, sir. That was Mr. Vyule Tuzungula, the president of the African Transformation Movement, uh, affectionately known as the ATM. Join us next time when we have another person of interest. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and comment. Sir.